We are now recording, but before we get started in the trig, let me just, these aren't really announcements, just bringing you a little bit up to speed. First, this is, of course, one of my brightest, best and brightest classes of all time, and yet, how many research papers have I received? Uh, Okay. Uh, pretty good looking rough draft, in my opinion. Uh, I can't see anything structurally that you need unless you had another work cited or is that just that true? I think that's just actually that Okay. And the only other thing I would say is you need to pay from one of your sources. You want to turn it in like that, or? Who's going to look at the A single page from one of your sources. Okay. And we're at the clock. Okay. But I'll take it. That looked like a good paper, you know. So. Okay, so there was uh, research papers. We may just double that soon. Uh, test one. Uh, there's still three people have not turned that in, one of them being present today, okay? And test two, long time ago, only two people have turned in, uh, one of who is, whom is present, but we others, so. And then test three, zero have been turned in. So we're, okay, do you need a copy of test three? Okay. It's terrible to be letting it pile up this late in the term. There's test three right there. All right. So, um, now let's just take a look at where we are and where we may be heading now. We're in 6.3 and just got started in it last time, so we'll continue in it today. Um, it's a fairly long section, so we may not finish it today, or we might, and then we only have 6.4 and 6.5 left. Now let's see what possibilities there are. I guess it's conceivable that we could finish 6.5 before the two weeks are over, and at that point, I can give you your 6.5, your chapter test four earlier. Most of the time, we're still working on 6.5 up until the last day of class. So then what I'll do is give you both the chapter six test, test four, and your final exam comprehensive uh, on the same day, next Thursday. If we finish 6.5, Five by Tuesday, I'll get it to you on Tuesday, you know, 6.5. Uh, but the odds are we'll still be on it because it's, these are sort of some long sections here. But uh, I will make your last test and your final a little bit shorter than the first three tests have been. They'll basically be one page, about 10 questions each, and, uh, and we'll, uh, you know, it'll be just sort of, so you can get it done a little bit faster than weeks and weeks and weeks and whole term, <laughs> that kind of stuff. You've got to have it in sooner. Are any of you graduating this term? You are. Okay, so I've got to have everything in for, from you. I, I don't know when, but I bet you it's by Wednesday anyway. Huh? I, yeah, I, yeah, the Wednesday final week, not, not next Wednesday. Yeah, so the Wednesday of final week, and so I've got to have yours in so I can get your grades in. The others of you can prolong it till Thursday, uh, but on Friday is graduation. We are having graduations now in fall term. This is the first time we've done it. I don't know exactly what time, 9 or 10 o'clock, something like that. Uh, I can't recall for sure, but it's going to be on the Birmingham West Campus, so I won't even be on this campus on Friday. 
uh, unless I make a special trip out there. So I need to have everything in by Thursday. Uh, now, grades for the rest of you are not due until Monday of the following week. So if you turn in something, slide it under my door. If you don't catch me on Birmingham campus on Friday, turn it in. And if I come in, uh, come in this Monday morning, then I will have time to grade it. But I can't be accepting it at 11.50 on Monday because I have to have it graded and grades in by noon on Monday. So uh, if you do have something left over, you can turn it in to me. Uh, Friday, slide it under my door because I'll be on the Birmingham West Campus on Friday. This is the finals week. This week and next week I'll be on Birmingham Campus Friday anyway because that's where I am on Fridays. Okay. Any questions on how we're going to wrap things up? Okay. Now we finished example one last time. So this is just a slide that was left over. Okay. So we are on uh, page 417 uh, in chapter six, which is additional topics in trigonometry. And one of these topics is dealing with vectors, okay? And you may not realize what this has to do with trig, but it will come out, okay? Um, and we'll be seeing a little bit more later. So let's first talk about component form. Any questions before we get started? Okay. Component form of a vector, okay? This is the neatest, easiest, most straightforward way to describe vectors is in component form. Sure, drawing graphs and things like this help to visualize them better, but to deal with them, to add them, subtract them, multiply them, whatever, you need them in component form. They're not going to be multiplying naturally, but well, in a sense, yeah. The directed line segment, that's what a vector is, directed line segment. Direction means it has a direction to it. Line segments means it has a fixed length or magnitude. So there's the magnitude, there's the direction. Okay, whose initial point is the origin is often the most convenient representation of a set of equivalent directed line segments. In other words, vectors. Okay, that represents the vector v in its standard position, with its initial point at the origin, and then going off in whatever direction this directed line segment or wherever it is for that fixed magnitude. A vector whose initial point is at the origin can be uniquely represented by the coordinates of its terminal point, and its terminal point we'll call v1 and v2. If its initial point is the origin, okay, then wherever the ter terminal point is, up here, over here, down here, over there, wherever it is, those coordinates will then represent that vector uniquely, because it's the only one that can start at the origin and be there. Okay. Um, now, in this text, whenever you have parentheses with a pair of numbers inside, okay, most in, in this context, I'll put it that way, that represents a point. V1, V2 would be the coordinates of a point. Okay. That's what the parentheses suggest. Jake is here. Alright. Now, that leads itself, lends itself to the component form of a vector. Okay? And if that vector has initial point of the origin, terminal point at V1, V2, and that's a point because it's in parentheses, ordered pair, then the component point of the form of the vector and this is a vector here, that's a point. The vector, bold V vector, is equal to angle bracket V1, V2. That means this is a vector whose X component is V1, whose Y component is V2. That's what that stands for. So that looks awfully similar to the point, that's in parentheses, but if it's a vector at the origin, then it's the same coordinates for this point will be the components for this vector. Now the words are similar, coordinates for a point, components of the vector. Okay? The simplest, most direct, 
easiest to deal with form of a vector, write it in component form. Now, back when I was growing up in mathematics, you, know, you might say, when you say component form of a vector, this is what it would mean, and we're going to get to it really soon, but just to let you know, we would have said, let me get my pen ooh, fixed. This represents V1I plus V2J. Okay? Where, again, V1 and V2 are the components of the vector. I is in the X direction and J is in the Y direction. And that's what I, if you would have asked me back when I was in to write it in component form, that's how I would have done it. Because we didn't use typically the angle brackets. That's sort of a more recent phenomenon. Okay? So much easier than having to write I's and J's and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the, uh, that's your component form. Angle brackets. Now, all of you are pre-engineering, right? No, you're not. Okay. But uh, you're graduating, so you won't be around here much longer. What is your major, by the way? Um, physical therapy. What? Physical therapy. Okay, right. Because you need the, the trig for physics, which you need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you going to come back here and take your physics, or take it elsewhere, you think? Here, okay, good. I do in the summer sometimes, but uh, but but fall and spring, Doctor uh, Bryant teaches it, and he's really good. Uh, so you, you, won't be, you need one or two quarters of it, uh, semesters of it. I, I thought that was the case. I don't know why you would need E and M. I can understand the mechanics, but I don't understand the E and M. But they usually require it. Yeah. All right. Now the others of you are you going to be here for a while? Of the two of you? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you continue here and you're pre-engineering major, and you have to take linear algebra, I chose a book for linear algebra by this same author, and linear algebra deals a lot with vectors and, and matrices, vector spaces, that kind of stuff. And in that book, he expresses this that way, which is drives me nuts because in this book he uses this way, makes a big deal about it, but in the other book he expresses the vector in that form, just like the point. You know, why? Why don't you use the angle brackets here? You did in the in the other book, and I use we use his book for calculus as well, and I think he uses the angle brackets there too. But in linear algebra, same author, but he uses the parentheses. I don't know why. Okay. Not important though. The coordinates V1 and V2 are uh, of the point are the same as the components of the vector V when it's in standard position starting at the origin. If both the initial point and the terminal point lie at the origin, guess what? Not much of a vector, is it? Not much direction. No direction to it and no magnitude, but yet it's called the zero, ve the zero vector. The V is called the zero vector, and it's often denoted by a bold zero, okay? Now that's what indicates it's a vector, is coordinates would be zero, zero, which violates the raw of everything we said about vectors so far. That they have some magnitude, this doesn't, and it has some direction. This doesn't, because how can they have a direction if it's not have a magnitude point anyway? So, but you have to have it, because of what I was just mentioning, vector spaces, one of the requirements of the vector space is you have to have the zero vector. Okay, otherwise it's not a vector. Okay. So here's the component form of a vector. The component form of a vector with initial point P1, P2, and terminal point Q1 and Q2. Notice this is not in standard form unless P1, P2 is the origin. So any old vector that's there, then here's how you write it in component form. PQ, P being the initial point, Q being the terminal point, then it's always terminal, terminal minus initial, final minus initial. Q1 minus Q minus P1 is the X coordinate, uh, X component, and Q2 minus P2 is the Y component, and this would be your V1, that would be your V2, and that would be the 
but if it's not has an initial point at the uh, origin, then you have to use the subtraction to get your component point. That gives you the V1, V2. The magnitude or the length of that vector V that doesn't start there would then be the initial point squared plus the terminal point that squared the square root of that. That would be the same as square root of V1 plus V2. V1 squared plus V2 squared. Exactly what we would have had if it were at then it's a uh, standard deviation. If this magnitude of V, up here we said if magnitude of V is zero, then it's a zero vector. If the magnitude of V is exactly, precisely one, then V is called a unit vector. Okay? And if it is zero, if and only if it V is zero vector, bolt zero. Okay. Now, the book doesn't make any special distinction <coughs> between writing V as a unit vector or writing V as any other type of vector. I do. Since I can't write bold like the book can, when I'm writing a general vector V, it's going to be written like this, with an error over it. If it's a unit vector, I'll write that V this way. I'll put a cap over it. Okay? Now that's my convention from long time passing, because that used to be what they did. Now they don't do a big deal about the symbols on top because they use bold print. Well, I can't write bold, so I still use those symbols. Okay, So the cap on it means it's a unit vector. An arrow means it's not necessarily a unit vector. And if it's a zero vector, we usually just write it as a zero vector like that. I can't write bold, so I put the zero with the arrow over it even though it has no direction. Okay. So, two vectors U, whose components would be U1, U2, and V, whose components would be V1, V2, are equal, and we talked about this before in general, equal if and only if U1 is precisely the same as V1, U2 is precisely the same as V2. That's the only way they can be whether they're located at origin or not at origin or wherever, they are equal vectors if those components in order are exactly equal. Okay? So if you go back to example one, when you have two vectors u being from point P00 zero, zero, to Q32, then its component form would have been 3, 2, right there. Okay. The vector V, who went from R12 to S44, four, four, its component form would have been 4 minus 1, 3, 4 minus 2, 2. It would have been 3, 2 as well. And then, looking at it, you can tell they're equal vectors. Before, we had to make sure the magnitudes were the same, make sure the directions were the same. You write it in component form, you look at it, and you can see whether it's the same or not. See, this is the best, most efficient, easiest form of dealing with vectors in component form. Not in RS form and PQ form, you know, that kind of stuff. If you write it in component form, it gives it to you just by inspection almost. So here's example two. Find the component form and the magnitude of the vector V, which has initial point at for negative 7 and terminal point at negative 1, 5. So let's first give the component form of vector V. So I'll open with a bracket and close with a bracket. What would be the first component? Four? Or it's just the jumping off point. Negative 1 minus 4, that's the x component. Five plus seven. Minus a minus seven would be plus seven. So what does that be in component form?
do the math. Now I get it five comma twelve comma the uh, twelve close. That's it. Okay. Now you could have found the magnitude given those two points, the terminal initial and terminal point. But now that you've already done the component form, what would be the magnitude of that vector v? Magnitudes are always square root of something. What would that be the square root of? Negative 5 squared plus 12 squared, which would be square root of? Anybody? Negative 5 squared. Pretty easy. Second. 25 plus 144. And that would be the square root of 169. Does anyone know what the square root of 169 is? Second. Box to sure slow you down a moment. 13, exactly. Okay. Square root of 169 is 13. Okay. So you see, calculate the uh, component form, and then from that, everything, just about, is so much easier to do. Magnitude, you don't have to go back and do your subtraction and square it. Since you already have done the subtraction, you just square it. Take a square root, add it, square it, add it, take a square root. You got it. Okay. I think that's all we have to do, so let me erase my stuff so you can see what how they do it, which is let P be, all right, uh, initial point, 4, negative 7, terminal point, negative 1, 5. The component form... A v, v1, v2 would be, v1 would be q1 minus p1, that's the terminal point minus the initial point, okay? Which would be negative 4 minus 4 is negative 5. v2 would be p2 minus p, q, q2 minus p2, which is 5 minus minus 7, which is positive 12. So V would be, there's your first part right there, the components negative 5 comma 12. Magnitude of that, once you know those components, just put them on the square root, squared, some of the squares, take a square root, and you get it. Square root of 159, 69, which is 13. By the way, if you haven't picked up on it, remember 3, 4, 5 is one of those Pythagorean triplets, which may what the Greeks used to call the perfect triangle uh, because all the sides were rational numbers, in fact, integers. And, uh, and 5, 12, 13 is another one of those. Okay. There are plenty of others, but those are two that you occasionally do run into. <clears throat> all right, that was example two. I do a little bit of graphics on the side. Let's now move to vector operations. Okay. Two basic vector operations are scalar multiplication and vector addition. Okay. Now, I mentioned linear algebra before. If and when you ever take your linear algebra, if you do, you'll find that these two operations are show up all the time when you're dealing with vector spaces. That's how you show the things and numbers are same place. These are the two defining operations. Scalar multiplication and vector addition. In operations with vectors, numbers are usually referred to as scalars. So if you just have the number 3, no direction associated, no anything, that's, that's a scalar quantity. 
for us to find is a scalar quantum. If you believe back to the future type stuff, then you go, oh, it has direction to it. Well, it really does. Time is time. Only has one direction. And that is just time. Mass is a scalar quantity. Energy is a scalar quantity. Um, most of the time, things like areas and volume, though later you'll see they do have some vector kind of sense to them, but most of the time those are just scalar quantities. Okay? We already talked about that a little bit here. So numbers are referred to as scalars. So when we're talking about scalar multiplication of a vector, that means you have a vector, you just multiply it by a number. If that number is greater than one, that's going to make that vector longer. Not going to change its direction any, but make it longer. If that vector is something less than one, like 0.3, or something like that, that's going to scale down the vector. So direction is going to be the same, but it's just going to make it short. If it happens to be a negative number, then what that does is change the direction of that vector and either scale it up or scale it down depending on the magnitude of that scale. Okay? And of course, if you multiply by 1, you just have the same vector. It doesn't change. A negative 1 would just change its direction but not its magnitude. And please don't go around multiplying by 0. If you do, you're going to get the 0 vector, which is not going to be all right, this is under there, right? Let's make this one line here. Okay. So that's what we mean by scalar multiplication. Now, vector addition is vector added to vector. Okay. Now, I just wanted to remind you of something, and this is probably seems far fetched, but remember. Our favorite fractions, you know, that we always did love, all that kind of stuff. Before you could add or subtract fractions, you had to have common denominators. Well, how am I relating that here? You can only add or subtract same quantity. You can add a scalar to a scalar, no problem. You can add a vector to a vector, no problem, as long as those vectors have the same dimensions. In other words, you can't do a two-dimensional vector added to a three-dimensional vector. You can't do that, but they have to be similar. Okay. But multiplication and division, you can multiply uh, the cost of your drink there by how many bottles you bought. Okay. Well, bottles times cost, those are different quantities. Now, if you're adding, you add cost to cost or you add bottle to bottle, right? But when you're multiplying, you can add cost per bottle times number of bottles and you're going to get another cost, okay? So, remember you can do that. So, when you're adding vectors, they have to be similar vectors. They have to be vectors. They can't be, you don't add a scalar to a vector. Multiply a scalar by a vector, no problem, but no adding, okay? Adding must be the same thing, okay? In this text, scalars will always appear, always be real numbers. We're not going to deal with complex scalars in this context. Now, I say that, and in a couple sections away, we're going to introduce a few I's, in it. and they'll take this, I don't know if they'll take it back, but I'll take it back for them. But so far, we're just going to do this. Geometrically, the product of a vector and a scalar is that the uh, vector is k times longer or as long as the original vector. Like I said, if k is a big number, it's going to make it a bigger vector. If it's a small number, it's meaning between 0 and 1, the magnitude, then it's going to shrink it. Okay? If it's 1, it's just going to make the same thing. Okay. So, let's take the case where k is positive. If kb has the same direction as v, does not change the direction any at all, if k is positive, and when k is negative, then it has exactly the opposite direction. So if this is your initial vector v, and you multiply it by any positive number, small positive number, it's going to be half of this. You know, it's one half. 2v would be same direction, but exactly twice the way. Okay? Negative v is going to exactly flip the direction. Exactly. It basically looks like the same line, it's just you reverse the initial and permanent points, basically. Uh, multiply 
prophesied negative number greater than one, you will both change its direction to exactly its opposite direction, and then extend the uh, magnitude by one half. So, uh, to add two vectors, u and v, now this should be on a different slide, okay, it's not. You can do it geometrically, okay, first position them without changing the length or directions, so that the initial point of the second vector, v, when you starting with u, adding v to it, coincides with the terminal point of the first vector u. So in other words, if this was your v, and u was a vector like this going in that direction, you would move, well, I'm doing it backwards, uh, move u to the terminal, initial point of u to the terminal point of v, keeping this in exactly the same direction of magnitude, and then your resultant vector would be from the initial point of v to the terminal point of u. If you're with the letters reverse. That's exactly why you add vectors geometrically. Okay. Now, this is the picture that went with that. The sum u plus v is the vector formed by joining the initial point of the first vector. Okay. That would be as you started with u. Here's your initial point of u, terminal point of u. Here's the initial point of v. Take this vector v, without changing its magnitude or direction, translate it up so its initial point is on the terminal point of u, and that gives you then the terminal point of v here. So then the resultant vector goes from the initial point of u to the terminal point of v, and that's exactly what you get. Now, remember I was doing it the other way? What if you did do that? But if you start with the vector v here and then add u to it, then we, without changing its magnitude or direction, move the initial point of u down to the terminal point of v, keep the magnitude and direction, and that would be the one. Well, guess what? If you look at that one and this one, they will be parallel exactly the same. In fact, this is what it is. There's v translated up here, and this is u translated over here. They're going to wind up at the same point. Exactly the same point. So here's something. Vector addition is commutative. It doesn't matter which order. U plus V is the same as V plus U. Okay? Now, they haven't gotten there yet, but since it's right here on the page, I'm showing it to you. Okay? So that's how we do it graphically, which is not the best way to do it. It's maybe visually compelling to do it that way, okay, fine, do it. But, if you just look at this, this has a weird start point here. I don't know how many units it is here, how many units it is here, and then all these others are weird points and stuff. If you add them, guess what's the easiest way to do it? By components. Everything done by components is easier, more straightforward, more direct. Okay. This technique is called the parallelogram law. U plus V, then do the uh, diagonal that connects the po opposite points of the parallelogram formed by U and V, putting U, uh, say, on the sides and V on the top and bottom, sort of like this. You form a parallelogram, the result of vector is your diagonal. <clears throat> Sorry. Over Thanksgiving, we went over to my family's farm over in Georgia, and all of my younger brother's kids and their kids were there, and one of my older brother's daughter and her child was there. The whole family were there. So I was surrounded by a bunch of toddlers, with snotty noses, and both my wife and I came back with <laughs> traces of cold. My wife was almost sick, and she had to travel to Philadelphia every day, um, and she was not looking forward to that at all. I just got sort of a sore throat and drainage and stuff, but hopefully not going to progress anymore. But 
If I sound pretty bad, that's why. Not my fault. Okay. So this technique is called the parallelogram law because when you add them like that, it forms a parallelogram. Okay. Uh, because the vector v, u plus v is often called the resultant or the sum of the vector addition. It's the diagonal of the parallelogram having the adjacent sides of u and v. Okay. So, the definitions of vector addition and scalar multiplication are here. If u is this vector, u1, v1, I mean u1, v2, as in uh, component notation, and v is this vector, v1, v2, as in component notation, uh, if those are both vectors, and by the way, these are the two states, two dimensional vectors, that's all we're dealing with now. If those are vectors, and k is some scalar, any constant. Positive, negative, fraction, decimal, rational, irrational, it doesn't matter, just any real number. No complex numbers here except real numbers. Okay? Then the sum of u and v, rather than drawing vectors and doing them resultant and parallelograms and that kind of stuff, all you do is add your component. u1 plus v1 is L to the component of the sum vector, and u2 plus v2 is the y component of the sum vector. See, everything is so much easier in component notation. Now, if you're trying to do scalar multiplication of k times u, remember k is just any real number, u is the vector u we had here, that would be k times u. We'll just write it as k times the vector u, v1, v2. That's exactly what you expect. And then, treating that angle bracket just as if it was a parenthesis, you just distribute the k across. That would be k u1, comma k u2, that's your k u vector in the multiplication. Hopefully just what you would expect it to be. Really easy to do in component form. Just distribute the k inside the angle brackets. Both are as many terms as you have there. Components that you have there. All right. Well, then what we would mean by the negative of a vector, the negative of vector v, where v would be the component v1, v2. Negative v would then put a negative 1 in front of v. Uh, now, here's the one thing that's a little bizarre here. I don't think they meant it, and maybe they did. I can't tell. That almost looks like that's bold like this. Maybe it's not. Maybe that and that are not bold. They're not quite as thick. I was going to say they printed them bold, but they really don't need to be. Because uh, that's the scale. That gives you bold. Well, you just distribute that. It would be negative V1 times um, negative V2. Now, these are just numbers. These are scalars here. They're the components of the vector. The vector has a magnitude and direction. These are just components. So those should be, and they are written as uh, scalars. Okay. You just negated the vector. Well, what did you do with that here? If this was V, negative V would be the, I don't know, you could write it here or here or here, anywhere, but it just points in the same magnitude, opposite direction. Okay. That leads to being able to do vector subtraction. So the difference of two vectors u and v, u minus v, is the same as, as we do with sine numbers. Take the first, add to it the opposite of the second. Right? If you subtract the sine numbers, it's the first plus the negative of the second. That's what you do, what you do with vectors as well. So it would be u minus v would be u plus the opposite of v, the negative. Now, if you did it by components, this would be u1, u2 minus v1, v2. It would be u1 minus v1 times u2 minus v2. You just do it just like this. You don't even have to do this change there. Just do it exactly. So even taking the difference, it's easier to do in uh, component uh, Now, if you feel really obliged to do your uh, geometric 
parallelogram type thing. You can, it's okay to do, if this is U, if that's V, then you get no A V this way. If that's U and that's V, then U minus V would be U plus the opposite of V, which is going to take V, flip it over, and add that to it, and here you wind up with U plus the opposite of V, which is U minus V. But if you just did it by component notation, U1, U2, we want V2, it all works out to be exactly that. Okay. Now, these two examples I've given you almost might lead you to some wrong conclusions. Okay. Let me go back to the earlier one. Here they drew U and they drew V, you know, they put them on top of each other. U plus V wound up with a larger magnitude there. You think that's always going to be the case? Not necessarily. If, you had, if V had been in this direction, then this would have wound up shorter than U to be larger. You can have vector addition that comes up being smaller. You can have vector subtraction that comes up being bigger. This one, they had you here subtract me from it, you got a smaller factor. It didn't have to be. If V had been in this direction, and you subtract that from you, you would wind up somewhere over here, which would have been longer than you. So don't think, just because these two examples, when they added the two, it wound up with a longer factor, and subtracted two, it wound up with a shorter factor. That's not always the case. It is with numbers, but not with factors. Okay? Because they're two dimensional. Okay. To represent the U minus V geomet geometrically, and that's what we just did, so this words are behind the slide, you can use the directed line segments in the same initial point. The difference U minus V is the vector from the terminal point of V to the terminal point of U, which is equal to uh, U plus a negative V as shown. Do I remember that? No. Do I even bother with drawing these? If I do, I just add, take U, draw negative V to it, and do it that way. I don't try to remember terminal point. It's too confusing. Just draw U and then draw negative V. If you have to draw it that way. How I do it? Component notation. It's so straightforward and easy. You don't have to think, oh, you know, we're going to put which. You don't have to do it. The component definitions of Vector addition, scalar multiplication are illustrated in chapter 3. Thank you very much. That's what we'll do next. In that example, notice that each of the vector operations can be interpreted geometrically if you need to, but who does? Okay? But you can. If it floats your boat, do it. Okay? So here is V, negative 2, 5 in component notation. The easiest, simplest, best way to go. And here's W, 3, 4. Find each of the following vectors. What in the world would 2v be then? What would that be? Negative 4, 10. You want to draw it vector geometrically? Why? Okay, it's so straightforward there. Okay, how about B? Okay, write down W first, 3, 4, minus, and write down V next, negative 2, 5. What would that be? We'll string it out if you need to. be the first component second I'll write it out three minus a minus two exactly five and the next four minus five so that would be as you said five comma
negative one. Right? Okay, so there's that. How about combining the two? Why not? V plus 2W. That would be V is minus 2 comma 5 in component form. The way to go, folks, plus 2 times component form 3, 4. This would be what? Anybody? Say that one more time. No. No. Do something. That's fine. <clears throat> Negative two plus six is four, comma. Yep, is thirteen. Now, I took a bunch of shortcuts there because Jake told me to. Uh, you don't have to write down all the intermediate steps, but you can sort of do almost do it in your head, can't you? But if you need to write them down, write them down. There's no problem with writing them down. This is negative 2 plus 2 times 3. Write it out, comma, 5 plus 2 times 4. Close the bracket. And you get it. 4, negative 13. Right? Okay. Let's see how they did it. Make sure we got it right. I'm going to erase mine. 2v would be, or not 2v, it would be 2 times negative 2, 5, which would be negative 2 times 10. 2 times negative 2, comma, 2 times 5, which would be negative 4, 10. And there they did it geometrically. Okay. First, let's see what they did. Here was the light gray one here, 2 negative 5, or I mean, negative 2, 5, negative 2, plus 5, and so they were, okay? And then negative 2 times that would be, so 2 times that, if we just take this and double it, okay? If we double this, we have negative 4, that would be negative 10. Along the same line, same direction, twice the magnitude. That's all it is. Maybe four Okay. Do I want to do that every time? Nah, but let's see. So, W minus V, W was the 3, 4, minus A, negative 2, 5. And again, you can just do it directly. 2 minus a minus 2, comma, 4, minus a 5. Got it. And then when you do the do the math, that comes up five negative one. Just like we got it. Just the same way we got it. And then finally the C. Oh, here's a sketch of that. Yay, I wanted that. Okay, here was your W. That's three, four. Three here, four up. Okay. And you're subtracting from that uh, negative two five. Well, negative two five. drawing does almost nothing for me. If anything, it almost confuses me. Just do the math. I mean, do, let the components tell you exactly what to do, and you got it confident. Okay? And now the C part. The sum of V plus 2W. Well, v is negative 5, negative 2, 5, and W is 3, 4. 2W would be 6, 8. They really do drag it out. So that would be negative 5 plus 6 is positive 4. 5 plus 8 would be 13. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is your 
z. Okay, maybe it's two pi. Okay, add to it twice that, so you're adding to it six four. And six from here would be uh, oh, sorry, six from here would be positive four, and then pi plus eight. There's a sketch. If you like the sketches, if they help you, by all means do it. But the product notation just does it so smoothly, easily, straightforwardly. So there we have it. Now, there's checkpoint two. I would definitely do the checkpoints as soon as you can after we finish class. And if you need help with those, audio and video solutions or possible solutions are available at LarsonFreeCalculus.com. No code required, just go to the website. Okay, so here is the sort of the summary of properties, vector addition and scalar multiplication, share many of the properties of ordinary arithmetic, in other words, the scalars. So here we have U, V, and W are three vectors. Now they all have to be in the same space, we're going to assume two space, X, Y, L. Are the vectors C and D are the scales, and we're assuming they're real numbers, no complex or imaginary numbers. Then the following properties are true U plus B is equal to Z plus U. I pointed that out to you graphically earlier and told you addition of vectors is commutative, just like addition of scalars is commutative. Okay, straightforward that. Now, this one you might have to think about a little bit, but I think you find out it does work out the same. If you're adding three vectors together, it doesn't matter if you add the first two, get that sum, and then add the third one to it, or take the first one and add the sum of the second two to it. You're going to get the same vector because basically you're taking the components of U, adding them to the components of V, and adding them to the components of W. You're just doing that. So it doesn't matter if you add these two first and then W, or add U plus V plus W. It doesn't matter. You're basically just adding the components. So addition of uh, vectors is commutative, just like the addition of numbers. I mean, associative, just like the addition of numbers. Okay? Well, this is why we have to have a zero vector. We say that vectors have to be close under addition. And other, I mean, uh, a space has to be closed under addition, meaning that this is one ramification of it. U plus the zero vector is always the vector U. Okay? Plus this U1, U2, and you're adding to it 0, 0. U1 plus 0 is U1, and U2 plus 0 is U2. U1, U2 is the same as U2. Here is the vector. So you're adding the zero vector. It's called the zero identity element. The zero vector is the zero, zero. Now, on the other hand, when you're adding to U exactly the opposite of U, this would be U1, U2 plus minus U1, U2. That would be U1 minus U2, and U1 minus U1 is zero, and U2 minus U2 is zero. That's zero, zero, that's the zero vector, and that shows up there. It's called, this is the additive identity element, this is the additive inverse property. There is an inverse, but when you add it, you get zero, including vectors as well. Now, we have to be a little more careful here. Is multiplication commutative or associative like addition is? You have to weasel some. We haven't even defined what it means to multiply one vector by another vector. So, can't do that yet. Okay? But what we have defined is scalar multiplied by a vector. So, if you have C multiplied by a vector du, where D is multiplied by u, you can associate the two scalars together and say that's the product of C times D times the vector u. So, you can. If you have the 
two scalars and one vector, they are associated with each other. The multiplication of them is the same. C times du is the same as cd times u. And you can do it out by components, which is really the best way to prove all of these, and you see that's going to be the case. This will be u1, u2, d times that would be du1 comma du2. Multiply c to that, you do cd u1 comma cd u2, and that would just be cu cd times u. That's how you prove one of these. All right. So we've sort of shown an associated property of multiplication as long as it's two scalars and one vector. Well, same thing here. If you're trying to show a distributive property, there's a couple of these. This is the one I would go with first, but they went with this one first. If you have the sum of two scalars multiplied by a vector, in other words, you distribute the vector across the addition of two scalars, that would be cu plus c. That's exactly what you get. Or, if you're doing one scalar across the sum of two vectors, you can add two vectors, no problem. You can't multiply them. But then you can do cu plus cv. And that works too. So there's two ways you can distribute vector and scalar addition and multiplication. Uh, either sum of two scalars distributed across a vector, or the sum of two vectors and distribute the single scalar across that. Okay? Now, <clears throat> just like up here we have a or additive identity album, we also have a multiplicative identity. And it's the same in vectors that is a number to number one. One times u equals u. Now that's a scalar one. This is a vector zero, but you can't add scalars and vectors. You have to have scalar and vector and vector. And that's a vector that has a u to zero in it. Here, though, you can multiply those vectors by, by scalars, and you still have that. So the number one is the multiplicative identity. Now, there's, I wouldn't want this in here because it's a different formula. You multiply 0 times the vector u, that's 0u1 comma 0u2, that's 0, 0, that's a 0 vector. So that's multiplying a scalar times a vector, 0 scalar, the scalar 0 times a vector u gives you the 0 vector. And then number 9. And this one you use occasionally, not too often, but if you have the magnitude of some constant times a vector, that's the same as the absolute value of that constant times the multiple, the magnitude of that vector. Okay? So basically you can factor out the C, but you have to factor out the absolute value of C. And here's part of the reason for that. Sorry, my throat hurts. Uh, not what I was going to say about it. Uh, the magnitude of a vector, remember this, the magnitude of a vector is always positive. No matter which direction the vector is going or anything else, its magnitude is a length. And lengths are positive, you know, like a distance. You can drive from here to Tuscaloosa, and that's what? Probably less than 60 miles, right? You can back up from here to Tuscaloosa, and you're still traveling 60 miles. So even though you're going backwards, it's still the distance you travel is 60, okay, or whatever it happens to be. So the same thing here. The magnitude of the vector is always positive. So if you're going to split this out, you have to use the absolute value of that C. That. That's always positive this is always Okay. That's too much time spent on one you hardly ever use. Okay. <clears throat> All right. There is an example four that they don't show on the slide set, but they do show in the book. So let's do example four before we move to unit vectors. I'll tell you what. 
it's nice that they have heat in this room. Yesterday morning they had none, and it was pretty chilly in here. But this is a little too hot for me. It's just drying out my head like crazy. Giving me a pretty bad headache if hot at that. Okay. So let's do example four. Find the magnitude of scalar multiples. So this is basically using that last one I said we hardly ever use. Okay. So here's what we have. Let u be a vector, since I don't write bold, I put the arrow over it. And this vector in component notation is 1, 3. Okay. Here's another vector, v. And in component notation, that's negative 2, 5. Okay, they seem to like that to be v for some reason. I don't know. U changes here, but yeah. Okay, find the magnitude of each scalar multiple. Okay, so A would be what's the magnitude? magnitude of 2u. Okay? Now, there's two ways to do it. Which way you want to do it? Okay. Components, yeah. So that would be the magnitude of 2 times u, which is 1, 3. Okay, and that would be the magnitude of, what would that be? Two, 2, comma 6. And then the magnitude of that would be, magnitude is always a square root of, 2 squared plus 6 squared, which would be the square root of 4 plus 36, square root of 40. Okay, and you could pull out what you wanted to if, if you wanted to. That would be 2 root 10. Right. All right. A positive number. The other way you could do it would be using the rule we just had, and that was the absolute value of 2, which would be 2, times the magnitude of u, which would be the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared, and that would be 2 times the square root of 1 plus 9, which is 2 times the square root of 10. Frankly, that's a little easier. Why? Because you've got smaller numbers. <laughs> you don't have to deal with these bigger numbers. But you get exactly the same answer. Okay? So there's the A part. And in the book, they got... Which way did they do it? They pulled out the absolute value of 2, which is just 2. And that is pretty easy. Okay? Let's do the B part. Because <laughs> my stomach is growling. Okay, I think what I'll do is erase... things up here but we'll go from here here's B and B says the uh, the magnitude of minus 5u okay how you want to do this okay he's going that way now so let me erase some more here I'll erase all this. We'll write it all again. No reason trying to conserve virtual pen. Okay. Absolute value of negative 5 times the magnitude of u. Okay. I'm going to write it that way. 
absolute value of negative 5 is? 5 times the square root of, you were getting ready to tell me. 1 squared plus 3 squared, which would be 5 times the square root of 10, you said? Yeah, that's it. Not much more you can do with it. Okay? You could have done it the other way and perhaps gotten somewhere with that, but who cares? All right, let's, goodness gracious. Uh, the C one here. I think we can do that on the same space here. The magnitude of 3D. And what would that be? Absolute value. Absolute value. Uh, <laughs> I get carried away with my double lines here. Absolute value of 3 times square root of negative 2 squared plus 5 squared which would be what's absolute value of 3? 3 times the square root of Yeah, 29. 4 plus 25 is 29. And that's it. I mean, there's not much more you can do with it because 29 for prime number, not going to be able to pull anything out of it. In addition to the heat, goodness gracious, it dry my eyes out. Ugh. Now, there is a blurb here on William Rowan Hamilton, Irish mathematician of read a few things that say he was the greatest Irish mathematician uh, or greatest mathematician Ireland's ever produced. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, some people think so. Did some of the early work with vectors. He developed a system of vector-like quantity called quaternions. And if you get into higher level math, you'll run into those babies too. Uh, And Hamilton was convinced the benefits of quaternions, the operations he defined, did not produce good models for physical phenomena, which was not until the latter half of the 19th century when Scottish physicist James Maxwell, uh, so there was an Irish and a Scot, basically working together, which is rather bizarre. And by the way, if you ever see his name, his middle name, James Maxwell, was C-L-E-R-K and for years I thought that was Clerk, James Clerk Maxwell, but I found out because he's Scottish, Scottish pronounce things however they want to and that becomes James Clark Maxwell, even though they spell it with an E it's pronounced as if it's an A so James Clark Maxwell uh, by the way, one of the greatest physical mathematicians I think of all time uh, he restructured Hamiltonian's quaternions forms that are useful for representing physical quantities such as forces, vectors, and acceleration. But he was most famous for his coming up with the four, they're called Maxwell's laws, I think they are, that relate electromagnetism to electricity and magnetism and the fields and basically hypothesized electromagnetic radiation long before we were able to study in depth. I think like 70 years later, they proved every one of his four empirical equations fit like a glove. I mean, didn't have to do any adjustment to them. He was really a brilliant guy. Okay. So they're both mentioned there. You could re use either one of them in a paper if you wanted to, either about their lives, about how they developed, what they developed, you know, anything you want. Now, I am pretty sure that somehow some of Hamilton's work later, like you see here, it says many years later, uh, and they did live some of this, 
same lifespan. Uh, Hamilton was 26 when Maxwell was born, so of course they wouldn't have interacted much then, but uh, when he, Maxwell died, I mean Hamilton died, Maxwell was only 34, so they could have had some time when they collaborated together. I don't know that they ever did, but maybe they did, uh, and then Maxwell lived longer. But in quantum mechanics, which didn't come along until basically early 1900s, they have a, an operator or a function, you might say, in quantum mechanics called the Hamiltonian. And I have never seen any other Hamilton name that I could even imagine that came from. So it seems like some of his work went into uh, the stuff that Maxwell did in physics and then later what some of the others did in quantum mechanics. So it's just pretty incredible that the theoretical work he did, though no one knew what to do with it at the time, later people found uses for it. Okay, did I just wonder away what little time we had left? How are we doing? We got one minute? Is that what you said? Huh? Not even a minute. Okay, so we'll start next time with the unit vector. Sorry I got to talking too much about other stuff. But we'll start next time with unit vectors. Let me give you a few homework exercises you can do. Uh, mark my place here. Yeah, we didn't get very far, did we? Uh, in 6.3, you can do number 9. You can do either 11 or 13. All of those odds are at calcchat.com, 11's at calcview. You can do 15 and or 17. They're both at calcchat. You can do any of the odds, 19 to 23. They're all at calcchat. 19's at calcview. Uh, you can do any of the odds, 25 to 29. They're all at calcchat. You can do any of the odds, 31 to 35. They're all at Calc Chat. 31's at Calc Q. You can do 37 or 39 or both. They're both at Calc Chat. 37's at Calc Q. Stop there. We'll pick up the unit vectors later. So you've got a few things you can work on there. Like I say, hopefully we'll finish 6.5, I mean 6.3 on Thursday and get started on 6.4. 6.4 is fairly long, but hopefully we'll get all of that done. Then, as I said before, they said we're only, in this text, we're only using real numbers. 6.5 is complex plane, which deals with complex and imaginary numbers. So what they were saying was not quite true, but we're going to use uh, this to help us do things in the complex plane. I don't know how far we'll get there. Uh, it's a fairly short section. Maybe we'll get to finish, maybe not, but we'll see. All right. And then there's 6-6. Six, six. I didn't realize there was 6-6. Six, six. I doubt if we'll get too far in that. We might, okay? But anyway, that finishes our section in Chapter 6. Good deal. We'll see you on Thursday.